This month we got some exciting news, including the announcement of our new e-ink based device called the Pine Note, as well as the PinePhone keyboard entering production, and more info about the PinePhone back cases. But there's more, we've also seen some development on PineDio, and a new firmware release for the PineBook Pro's trackpad. This is the video version of the community update, so this is not as detailed as the version on the Pine64 blog, but this will give you the synopsis. Also thanks to JF, Alex, Dank12, Peter, Martine Bram, Brian, Gammy, Alfred, Dylan, Chris, and Lucas for helping with this community update. And if you want more open source related videos, check out my channel, Pizza Loving Nerd. Let's jump straight into housekeeping. Late last month, DHL accidentally shipped all of our PinePhone orders to New Zealand. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get them shipped back to Hong Kong quickly, so instead, we're reshipping all orders from our Hong Kong warehouse, so you won't have to wait until the misplaced pallet of pine phones is returned to us. Those of you still waiting should have tracking numbers by the time this post goes live, or shortly after. It has now been a year since we moved our websites to a cluster made out of 24 Rock Pro 64s, and with an exception of some minor issues, the cluster has been running non-stop for 354 days now. We have now decided to build a small temporary cluster to house our important services while we work on our main host cluster. In the coming weeks, you should see an article about this temporary cluster on the Pine64 blog, and we will provide updates, so stay tuned. Lastly, Lucas was a guest on Destination Linux to talk about the Pine Note, as well as some other gear, including the PinePhone keyboard, so go check that out. Now on to what you are probably watching this video for, Pine Note. It is an e-ink device, and it is one of, if not the most powerful, e-ink devices on the market. It shares a lot with the Quartz 64, including the same ARM-powered quad-core RK3566 CPU, as well as 4 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage. It will also have two microphones and speakers, a USB-C port for charging and data transfer, and 5 GHz Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The e-ink panel is a 10.1-inch 3x4 panel with a resolution of 1404 by 1872 this panel can display 16 levels of grayscale and is capable of a 60 Hz refresh rate. The panel is front lit and allows you to choose between cool and warm light adjustment to prevent eye strain in dim environments. And on top of the e-ink panel sits a capacitive glass layer for touch input as well as a Wacom electromagnetic resistance layer which allows for EMR pen input. We think that this device will be useful for reading books, sketching, taking notes, and using tools like LibreOffice while preventing eye strain thanks to the e-ink display. Although given that it is based on the Quartz 64, it has a lot of other use cases too. This will be available for early adopters later this year for $399 and will include a magnetic cover as well as an EMR pen, although these will be sold separately after the early adopters batch. As for other hardware, the PinePhone keyboard has entered production, and we expect it to show up on the Pine Store in late September. Not only does it feel amazing in the hand, but the keys are sturdy, easy to plunge, and have a satisfying amount of key travel. The product team and vendor have done a great job. One noticeable difference from previous prototypes is the removal of the LEDs in the upper corner of the chassis. The PCB under the hood has also been reworked in order to implement more feedback from developers. So. Thanks to all the developers who spent time reviewing the hardware and suggesting improvements. We have sent out samples of the PinePhone back cases to developers and settled on a wireless charging solution. We managed to figure out a reliable way to flash the fingerprint reader firmware at the factory. As a result, we will likely be able to introduce the fingerprint and wireless charging cases in a matter of weeks, hopefully sometime in October. Firmware and software has been sorted out on the fingerprint reader case and has been easy to implement into existing PinePhone operating systems. Ubuntu Touch on the PinePhone has always used Wayland for displaying app content, mainly due to it being easy during the initial bring up. However, this was going to require the Ubuntu Touch team to implement some functionality in order to allow the same experience across all supported devices. In order to bring the same experience to PinePhone users as quickly as possible, they have decided to add support for Mirror Client in addition to Wayland. This practically means that Ubuntu 2004 based versions of Ubuntu Touch will feature support for both apps that use Mirror Client and Wayland only apps. 
This will also allow for extra features like trust props for permission management. Ubuntu 20.04 based Ubuntu Touch Images should be available soon, and you will also be able to switch to it through the command line without losing data or reflashing. Now, let's quickly show off some cool work that the community is doing to support the PinePhone. Dylan is working on allowing the PinePhone to be used on car systems in order to receive calls without even touching the PinePhone. This is done thanks to Dylan's work on the BlueZ backend in the OBEX daemon to access the Evolution data server, which is what Fosh uses to store contacts. Chris has been finalizing MMS support in Fosh, as well as developing two new applications that allow support for visual voicemail. Visual voicemail daemon runs in the background in order to receive and store voicemails from your carrier, and visual voicemail player is a front end for the daemon that gives it a graphical user interface. Peter from Linmob has been maintaining a list of Linux smartphone apps for a while, and it now lists more than 300 apps. However, the current technical implementation of the website does not perform well, which is why he is working on a new implementation of the website with some speed boosts. You should be able to test this new website out later this month at alpha.linuxphoneapps.org. And finally, UJC, the guy on Reddit, has found a way to record video on the PinePhone at 720p, 30fps. While it's not perfect, this is definitely a good step towards full video recording on the PinePhone. One of the main complaints of the PineBook Pro has always been the trackpad. This trackpad lacked precision and had a delay between input and cursor movement. All of these issues are now gone thanks to the new firmware. This update can be performed from any OS on the PineBook Pro, and it will soon be available as a firmware package for FWUPD. However, if you don't want to wait for this package, the firmware can be updated today by just about anyone who is capable of following written instructions. In other PineBook Pro news, Box64 released a new x86-64 emulator for ARM last month, and this emulator allows you to run standard x86 applications on your PineBook Pro without the use of containers or other trickery. There is still a loss of performance through emulation layers, but this is expected even with technology like Apple's Rosetta used on the M1 Max. Lastly, IPS display prices are finally starting to come down, but their price point hasn't reached a level where we could manufacture a new batch of laptops. That said, if prices decrease further in the coming weeks, we will start exploring potential for another batch. In other words, there is a good possibility that we'll see another large batch of PineBook Pros before the end of the year. Development on the PineTime is still going very strong. As detailed in last month, AffiniTime 1.3 came out with a new PineTime style watch face inspired by Pebble, as well as battery level notifications which GadgetBridge uses to show a battery usage graph, Little FS, which allows things like persistent storage and more space for features, and WaspOS has seen some big improvements too, including a newer version of MicroPython and an advanced alarm system. There were some memory improvements that free up 10% of its RAM, and Stiguo is also now on Flathub, which brings it to many more Linux distros. The privacy friendly fitness tracking app, FidoTrack, now supports AffiniTime and records GPS positions speed, distance, and displays nice stats and graphs about your workouts while getting heart rate information from AffiniTime. Finally, two companion apps for the PineTime are in works called Homosus Time and Affini iOS. These apps are still in early development stages, but they already have features like time syncing, battery life and heart rate monitoring, and over-the-air updates. JF and LUP are the first developers to get their hands on PineDio gear, including the PinePhone back case and the PineDio stack announced in last month's update. Just as a recap, the PineDio stack is a development kit focused around the Buffalo BL604 MCU, which is similar to the BL602, except it has more IO pins available and provides LoRa connectivity via a SX1262 LoRa module, and it also exposes a number of BL604's IO, including USB-C, JTAG, and GPIO, and also be fitted with a small LCD panel. Much work will still be needed to have the PinePhone communicate with the PineDio LoRa back case, and the stack is already showing early signs of life. In fact, JF is planning on bringing AffiniTime, the default firmware running on the PineTime, to the PineDio stack in the near future. So, that's the video. We hope you have a great 
month before the next update. And to end this video, here's Bad Apple playing on the Pine Time.